October 1796, the French armies retreated behind the Rhine, and now the situation on the Italian front was becoming the toughest since the start of the campaign. It was completely obvious to the French that after the retreat of General Moreau's army, the Austrians could very promptly concentrate their forces against Bonaparte. Finally, four weeks after the Battle of Bassano, the Austrian generals were able to gather a new army of 47,000 men for a decisive offensive. Josef Alvinci became the army's new commander. He was an experienced and brave general who had been through many battles and campaigns. Franz von Weyrother headed the Austrian army headquarters. The Austrians planned to make the offensive with two powerful corps from the north and east. The main goal was the same, to free the Mantua fortress and expel the French from Italy. By this time, Bonaparte couldn't fully replenish his losses which he had in the previous battles. Despite his multiple requests for help, the French government wasn't able to swiftly send reinforcements to Italy. Nevertheless, Bonaparte used absolutely all opportunities to strengthen his army. In Milan, the French organized a temporary government that formed the Lombardy Legion, consisting of 3,000 men. They had plans to undertake similar actions in other regions. Also, to win time, Bonaparte tried to organize negotiations with the Austrians. However, these all fell into the background because in early November 1796, the Austrian army started its massive offensive. The first corps of General Alvinci, consisting of 28,000 men, started its offensive from the east. Massenau's division was responsible for the defense of the eastern sector's front. The second corps of Davidovich, consisting of 18,000 men, attacked from the north. It was opposed by 9,000 men in the division of Vubois. It was presumed that these two corps would crush Bonaparte's troops near Verona, after which they would go to Mantua. The fortress's garrison also had to support this attack. Bonaparte faced an extremely challenging task. Having only 40,000 soldiers, he had to hold 20,000 soldiers of Wormser's army in Mantua and repel an attack of 47,000 soldiers from General Alvinci's army as well. The French had to undergo one of the most serious tests in the entire campaign. So, the Austrian army began an offensive. On November 2nd, Alvinci's corps were promptly approaching the Brenta River in two columns. At the same time, the first battles of the northern sector of the front began and they were not in favor of the French. General Vubois, despite all his efforts, couldn't hold the positions near Trento and had to retreat to Rovereto with serious losses. However, despite the fact that Vubois retreated from Trento, Bonaparte was still assured that the front's northern sector was the most suitable for defensive actions. On these mountain positions, they could hold Davidovich's troops for three or four days without too much effort. During this time, Bonaparte wanted to concentrate the divisions of Augereau and Massanau near Bassano and crush Alvinci's corps. So, General Vubois received the order to take the position near Rovereto and hold Davidovich's corps for as long as possible. General Kilmaine's division, which consisted of 8,000 soldiers, was ordered to hold Wormser's troops in Mantua. Having given all the orders, Bonaparte, with the division of Augereau and the reserves, headed into the forced march to the east to fight Alvinci. The French had intended to attack the Austrians at that moment when they should have started to cross the Brenta River. On November 6th, the French divisions gathered near Vicenza and as soon as the Austrians started crossing the river, Bonaparte began his attack. Augereau's division entered the battle with the enemy near Bassano. Massena went to Fontaniva and attacked the Austrians on the western bank of the Brenta River. In the beginning, the battle favored the French. Massena was very close to defeating the Austrians' left flank. However, 
Alvinci promptly reacted to this threat and strengthened the positions near Fontaneva. He also sent additional reserves to defend Bassano. Eventually, the battle, which lasted all day, did not bring the French any results. They suffered only losses of manpower. Moreover, this very evening brought gloomy news from the front's northern sector. It became known that General Vaubois hadn't held his position near Rovereto. His division was defeated and fled the battlefield in panic. Vaubois stopped his fleeing soldiers only near Rivoli. It was obvious that the front's northern sector was about to break down. This sudden news forced Bonaparte to return immediately to save the northern flank. On the night of November 7th, Bonaparte arrived at the position near Rivoli and had severely scolded the soldiers of Vaubois. Soldiers, I'm discontented with your actions. You showed neither courage, discipline, nor perseverance. You retreated from positions where even a handful of men could have stopped an entire army. However, a scolding wasn't enough to rectify the situation, and Bonaparte had to send in additional reinforcements, headed by General Joubert, to help Vaubois. As a result, the total number of soldiers in Vaubois' division reached 13,000 men. Thus, the northern flank was temporarily secured. However, on the eastern flank, the menace was growing bigger since Alvinci's corps was swiftly approaching Verona. The situation became threatening and Bonaparte had to react immediately to the new menace in the eastern sector. On November 11th, the Austrian troops were 12 miles away from Verona. Alvinci concentrated nearly 17,000 soldiers on the position near Caldiero. The rest of the troops covered the crossings over the Adige River. Bonaparte, by this time, was able to concentrate 14,000 soldiers near Verona. A few more thousand were covering the south flank. In spite of the enemy's advantage in the number of soldiers, Bonaparte decided to attack. In the early morning of November 12th, the French attacked the Austrians near Caldiero. Bonaparte's troops fought very bravely, but the forces were too unequal. Moreover, during the battle, heavy rain with hail started, which worsened the attackers' positions even more. At the end of the day, another attempt to crush Alvinci's corps was unsuccessful for the French. Having already lost around 2,000 soldiers in this battle, the French retreated to Verona. The unsuccessful battle of Caldiero had a detrimental effect on the morale of the French soldiers. The troops were morally cracked. Deadly silence was reigning in our rows. We tried not to say aloud our impressions because of the danger of losing the respect of our comrades. Obviously, the French army's position was hopeless. The Austrians outnumbered the French in every sector of the front. In this situation, Bonaparte started having doubts about surviving. Perhaps we are standing on the verge of losing Italy. No promised reinforcements arrived. However, I will still fulfill my duty. Joubert, Lan, Linus, Murat, Rampon, they are all injured. Perhaps the hour of the intrepid Augereau, the brave Massena, and my own death is at hand. We are abandoned in the depths of Italy. Thus, the front was on the verge of collapse, and many French officers were preparing for the worst. Yet in this critical moment, Bonaparte was able to find a way out of this deadly position. He adopted the decision to regroup his forces and, together with Augereau's and Massena's divisions, as well as with all his reserves, make a maneuver to the Ronco village. After this, he planned to force the Adige River and attack the enemy from behind. Such a maneuver, no doubt, would force General Alvinci to refuse his attack on Verona and deploy his troops to repel the attack of the French. In this offensive operation, Bonaparte was able to engage 18,000 soldiers. Alvinci had about 24,000 soldiers. 
So after having left 2,000 soldiers in the Verona garrison, Bonaparte began his great maneuver. Having walked 17 miles overnight, the French reached Ronco in the early morning. Thanks to the coordinated and fast work of troops of engineers, the pontoon bridge was already erected. Soon, Augereau's division started crossing the Adige River first. This audacious maneuver of Bonaparte really concerned General Alvinci. It wasn't possible to assault Verona while the French army was still a threat to the rear. After a short consideration, Alvinci decided to stop the offensive of Verona and forward his troops against Bonaparte. Meanwhile, two French divisions had already crossed the Adige River using the pontoon bridge and prepared for the battle. The entire land on the northern shore between the rivers Adige and Alpone was swampy, so it was possible to move on that land only on thin dams. From Ronco, only two dams led through the swamps. One was along the bank of Adige, heading Belfiore. Another one was along the bank of Alpone, heading Arcole. Thus, in the early morning of November 15th, General Massena led his division ahead on the left dam. Around 9 a.m., the French threw back the enemy's advance soldiers and took the village of Bionde. Next, Massena's soldiers reached Belfiore and entered a severe battle with the Austrian division of General Provera. At this time, Augereau was moving on the right dam to Arcole, his task was to cross the Alpone River and seize the San Bonifacio village. This would put Alvinci's corps in a very vulnerable position. But as soon as the French approached the bridge near Arcole, they learned that two Austrian battalions and several cannons were guarding this bridge. Nevertheless, the French decided to attack immediately. Brigadier General Verdier headed the grenadiers in the bridge attack. However, as soon as the French approached the bridge, they were met by strong enemy fire. Eventually, Verdier had to retreat with serious losses. Seizing Arcole became an extremely difficult and dangerous undertaking. However, there was no way back for the French. Brigadier General Bonn headed in the new attack on the bridge. And once again, the Austrians, using guns, successfully repelled the French assault. As a result, General Bonn was severely wounded and his soldiers retreated. But even that didn't break the French. The bravest, General Lannes, headed another assault on Arcole. Leading the 51st Half Brigade, he rushed the bridge. However, these brave men also were met with a volley of buckshot. Consequently, Lan and all the officers that were going among the first together with him received horrible wounds. The French position worsened because as each hour passed, the Austrians received reinforcements. But despite the deadly danger, the French generals did not stop to attack Arcole. Our most glorious generals headed the assault columns one after another. They personally moved ahead and called the others to follow them. They screamed at their soldiers, begged them, but no one followed them. Bonn, Lan, Verdier, they all returned with serious injuries. Then, Division General Augereau headed the assault column. He grabbed the war flag and personally walked towards the bridge with the words, Cowards, are you afraid of death that much? However, even the division's commander's valor could not bring the soldiers to the attack. They thought it was impossible to cross that bridge. And at that moment of indecisiveness, Bonaparte arrived at the battlefield. To everyone's amazement, he decided to head the assault on the bridge personally. Practically all officers decided to follow Bonaparte on Arcole's assault. Even Lan, wounded twice, stood up from his stretcher to join the assault. 
Not having enough strength to stand on his own two feet, he arrived at Arcole by horse. Thus, taking the war flag, Bonaparte headed the column and went ahead. When only tens of yards were left to the bridge, one of the officers who were near Bonaparte had a nervous breakdown. He stood in the way of the commander-in-chief and started begging him not to go on that bridge. My general, you will be killed. Without you, we're lost too. You cannot go ahead any further. You don't belong there. As a result of the confusion, the column stopped practically right by the bridge. The Austrian cannoneers used this confusion and the volley of cannons started sounding within a few moments. The flurry of buckshot hit the column directly, causing terrible damage. Many soldiers and officers were killed on the spot. However, the Austrians were not able to kill the French commander-in-chief. A jundant Muiran covered Bonaparte with his body. This devoted 22-year young officer sacrificed his life to save the commander-in-chief. After this horrible volley, the soldiers started to run back. In this turmoil, Bonaparte fell into the water and was saved by his loyal adjutants, who took him out and brought him to safety. Thus, all attempts of the French to seize Arcole quickly failed. Only around 7 p.m., the 3,000-man squad was finally able to force the river near Alboredo and get to the rear of Arcole. This forced the Austrians to retreat, and, as a result, by the end of that day, the French seized Arcole nearly without any fight. However, that victory took six hours longer than expected. By that time, Alvinci concentrated nearly all his troops around San Bonifacio. Hence, Bonaparte's initial plan, which presupposed breaking through the enemy's rear stronghold, has become practically pointless. Nevertheless, the first day of the battle wasn't without success. The menace to Verona faded away, and it seemed like Alvinci refused the hope of a quick reunion with the corps of Davidovich. Moreover, the news that the commander-in-chief personally led the soldiers to attack Arcole had fantastically increased the morale of the French army. The troops were filled again with the decisiveness and desire to fight. In this way, the French, despite anything, wanted to continue the battle. On the evening of November 15th, Bonaparte came up with a new plan. Now, the French task was not to attack the Austrians at the rear, but to lure them into swampy lands where their outnumbering wasn't important anymore. In this situation, troops would have to fight on narrow dams and only the soldiers' personal bravery and stamina would be a decisive factor in this battle. In addition, there was another menace. Bonaparte, fearing the breakthrough of the northern flank by Davidovich's troops, ordered to leave Arcole, which cost him so much blood, and move the army to the Adige River's right bank to have a possibility to come to Vubois' aid quickly. The situation with the front's northern sector was clear only after the adjutant of General Vubois, appearing late at night to Bonaparte, reported to him that the northern sector was under control. So, making sure that Davidovich's soldiers didn't break through, Bonaparte adopted the final decision to continue the fight with Alvinci. In the early morning, General Alvinci sent his troops to Ronco, believing that the French were retreating. However, that was exactly what Bonaparte expected. As soon as the Austrians were on dams, Massena's division counterattacked with full decisiveness. The famous 32nd Half Brigade was in the thick of the fight, led by General Gardon. He ordered his soldiers not to shoot, but to use bayonets only. At the same time, on the right dam, Augereau's soldiers attacked Mitrotsky's division. Verdier's grenadiers that were moving in the avant-garde defeated everyone in their way. Eventually, by noon, 
the French were able to move the enemy back to Belfiore and Arcole. However, Alvinci didn't want to give up his positions and forwarded more and more battalions to these swamps. Alvinci recalled an old principle. When the enemy is pressed to the river, you must attack it. But he forgot another not less important rule. When you outnumber the enemy, you must fight with it on the open terrain, not going to rough terrain, where the small number troops are almost the same strength as the large number ones. Thus the battle on the dams continued all day, and both armies fought until twilight. Immediately after the battle, Bonaparte again led his troops to the right bank of the Adige River to be prepared for any unforeseen movement on the north flank. Bonaparte's concerns weren't in vain, because that night he received news that Vubois' division retreated from Rivoli. It became obvious that the northern flank was on the verge of defeat, and Bonaparte had very little time to conquer Alvinci. However, despite the critical situation in the northern sector of the front, Bonaparte adopted the decision to finish Alvinci. General Kilmaine received the order to send 3,000 men to Romco immediately as reinforcement. Thus, Kilmaine only had left around 5,000 soldiers to contain Wormser's troops in Mantua. Bonaparte risked a lot because Wormser had a great chance to break through from the fortress. Nevertheless, Bonaparte took that risk. The order to join the battle was also received by a small French garrison, which was located at Lenyago. So as to lure the Austrians to the dams again, Bonaparte disseminated false information that the French had started to retreat to Mantua. Thus, Bonaparte scheduled the decisive battle for November 17th. At dawn on November 17th, misled Alvinci again sent his troops to Ronco to get after the French. But the French didn't think to retreat. In a moment, the signal to attack sounded, en avant. and Massanaugh's division rushed into attack through the morning mist. The heavy fight began again. Despite terrible tiredness, the French fought devotedly, shocked. Alvinci threw nearly all his troops at the dams. As a result, Massanaugh found himself in difficult situations, but despite this, he continued to lead the troops, lifting his hat on the end of his saber as if it were a war flag. The 32nd Half Brigade was particularly distinguished in the battle. Hiding behind the dam in the bushes, the soldiers of Half Brigade allowed the enemy to approach as close as possible and then unexpectedly threw themselves into the attack and nearly completely crushed the 3,000-man Austrian squad. So, after Massena distracted the enemy's main forces toward himself, Bonaparte started the flank attack. Augereau's division forced the river near Alboredo and attacked the Austrians on the eastern bank of the river Alpone. This attack coincided with the arrival of reinforcements from Lenyago. Bonaparte also threw General Kilmaine's reinforcements into battle. Despite tremendous tiredness, the French continued to attack in all directions, showing unparalleled courage. At around 5 p.m., Massena and Augereau, acting together, captured Arcole. This forced the Austrians to retreat to San Bonifacio again. As a result, by the end of the third day of the Battle of Attrition, Alvinci lost his temper and commanded the soldiers to retreat to Vincenza. Thus, the three-day Battle of Arcole ended with a victory for Bonaparte. It was a true feat of the French soldiers' endurance. The losses of both armies were huge. The French lost about 4,500 men. The Austrians lost 7,000 dead, wounded, and POWs. Despite still outnumbering the French, the Austrian army no longer had enough morale or physical power left to continue the fight with Bonaparte. 
On the day after the battle, the French went to help Vaudois. However, as soon as Davidovich found out about the approaching Bonaparte army, he hastily retreated back to the north. Thus, Bonaparte again prevented a catastrophe despite being outnumbered by the enemy. The victory in the Battle of Arcole was Bonaparte's greatest achievement at that time. His actions and tactics in this particular case were the actions and tactics of the world's greatest master of the military art. They were all conceived and performed lightning fast, and the Austrians did not have a clue of what he was doing.